Okay, right. Hi, everybody. So sorry about that. So I'm just going to go through acute visual loss. And the idea is just to sort of go through some principles and give you some examples and things like a refresher, rather than having an exhaustive talk, um, because that would go on forever, really. Okay, so. Uh, hmm. All right, so first bit I'll talking about the differences between acute and gradual visual loss. And then the second part, I'll be talk, talking about some of the commoner causes of acute visual loss and go through a few clinical cases at the end. And then I've got a PDF that I will give Bavina to send around so you can test yourself um, on a few signs and things as well, okay? So when we're talking about visual loss, what we mean that there's, to have visual loss, you must have one of three things, either loss of transparency of the visual axis, so something the cornea, lens or vitreous, for example, or a retinal pathology. And if the macula is involved, you're going to expect the visual loss to be more significant, or you have some pathology of the optic nerve or the visual pathway. So when you're thinking about someone who's presenting with visual loss, it's really helpful to know how it presented. So the sort of the temporality of it all. So for acute visual loss, you're talking about symptoms which come on suddenly. So basically over minutes, hours, or at the most a few days. That may be one single episode, or you may have recurrent episodes that are similar. Um, and it's really helpful to know whether that visual loss is associated with pain or not. So if they're painless, the commonest cause will be some sort of ocular ischemia uh, causing the loss of vision. When someone has gradual visual loss, the symptoms come on slowly over the course of weeks or months. And so because it's quite a long drawn out um, presentation, usually gradual visual loss is painless. You can have acute visual loss obviously becoming, um, becoming um, chronic over time, uh, and then it may sometimes mimic gradual visual loss. So thinking about gradual visual loss again, you're, we're talking about whether it's painful or painless. So if you have a painful eye with acute visual loss, it'll usually be red. And that's because of the ocular surface inflammation. So you want to be thinking about trauma, um, corneal infections, anterior uveitis, possibly endophthalmitis if they've had an intraocular procedure um, and acute glaucoma. Optic neuritis and arteritic anterior ischemic optic neuropathy can cause painful visual loss, um, even though they're essentially ischemic types of problems. And that's because the pathologies happen at the back of the eye. So you're not going to see any inflammation associated with it. When you have a painless pers person presenting with painless visual loss, the eye will usually be white, okay? So again, you're thinking about the ischemic things. So think about the retinal artery or vein occlusions. Uh, here we then have the non-arteritic form of anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, uh, vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment, and things like CVA uh, may also present as a, um, acutely uh, as acute visual loss. Knowing whether the, the problem is unilateral or bilateral is helpful. So generally, um, people refer um, presenting with acute visual loss will usually have a unilateral condition. All right. When, it, when they have a bilateral pathology, usually it will be a gradual visual loss. And gradual visual losses include the common things like refractive errors, cataract, um, chronic glaucoma. But they also include things that you get uh, uh, the ocular uh, manifestations of systemic disease. So things like the diabetic and the hypertensive retinopathies. And again, cerebral vascular accident can, it was bilateral and can mimic um, uh, gradual visual loss as well. But it's a slightly different thing because it does also present acutely. When you have unilateral acute loss, you are, you know that the pathology is anterior to the optic chiasm. So that's helpful for um, localizing it. And if you've got a bilateral acute visual loss, you know that the lesion has to be either at or posterior to the optic chiasm or likely to be due to systemic disease. So knowing those things helps you pinpoint where to look for the pathology and what associated conditions uh, that you should be looking for. So we've got some typical presentations that we're all familiar with. So if someone presents with visual loss or field loss, sometimes they might describe it as preceded by sudden onset of floaters and photopsia. We usually think of a retinal detachment. If they have a sudden drop in vision with a history and they're known to have poorly controlled diabetes and previous retinal laser treatment, particularly if they describe a red cloud they're looking through, you're going to be thinking about a vitreous hemorrhage. And all those features of the presentation are really helpful uh, in your decision making. 
And if you've got a young patient, particularly if they're Caucasian, they've got reduced vision in one eye, pain on the eye, uh, particularly on movement, and they've got any features or history of multiple sclerosis, then the first thing you're probably be thinking about is optic neuritis. And in this case, again, you'd expect the eye to be white rather than red, even though it's painful. So let's go on to common causes of acute visual loss then. So we'll think about the painful causes first. So trauma, probably unlikely to present really to a high street optometrist, but if you're working in mechs or working in an eye casualty, they might do. And probably the most likely things to present to you would be the blunt injuries and occasionally the chemical injuries. Usually the penetrating and perforating injuries would go straight to major A&E. Um, most of the blunt injuries are sports related, but they can also be as from assault, from a fist or something. And chemical injuries are quite often uh, occupational, but can also be assault. I mean, there was a period when people were going around with um, alkalizing GIF bottles and squirting people's faces. So, um, you know, that that is a, a reason for chemical injury as well. But cleaners and so on are particularly prone to that. So. Blunt injury, then the things for you to look for if someone pops into your high street practice or your eye casualty, look for extensive hemorrhage. That's quite a worrying sign of globe, possible globe rupture. Look at the anterior segment, so they might have some hyperemia. Look for high femur, which usually, which will tell you that there's been um, probably iris trauma or some bleed from the back coming forwards. And look for a dilated pupil, which would suggest that the sphincter of the pupil has been ruptured. On fundoscopy, when you dilate them, you'll you often see these pale areas of the retina, which is where there's retinal edema, and underneath that is photoreceptor disruption. So those are areas that you'll probably have some impairment of vision, um, subtle probably on the field, even when everything recovers and the edema resolves. So if you see someone, really important as part of your assessment as well, um, for blunt injuries to check eye motility. So if you've got abnormal eye motility, particularly if you've got restriction of up gaze, you really want to be thinking of orbital floor fractures because uh, that any sort of ocular motility problems increases the risk that there has been an orbital fracture. And then you want to get them seen quite rapidly. You do need to be always have back of your mind that there's possible risk of uh, globe rupture. So minimal ma manipulation of the eye, no pressing or anything. You want to avoid them from rubbing or touching their eye. So that's why that image has someone with a shield, cartella shield on to try and remind them not to touch it. You also need to remind them not to strain or blow their nose uh, because that can increase the intraorbital pressure and cause uh, more contents in the eye if there's been a rupture to extrude outwards and advise them to remain kneel by mouth because they're going to have to go to an A&E and be assessed and in case they need surgery they will need to be kneel by mouth for a general anaesthetic which is what will require to repair a globe rupture or an orbital fracture. Uh, these are just interesting images, but sometimes you'll see the sequelae of them. So you might see a distorted pupil and some scarring, some scarring here on the cornea from lacerations. And just as something, again, high, very, very rare for anyone to actually uh, see a patient ever present with something in the eye. But if you do, please don't be tempted to remove it from the eye, because the moment you remove it from the eye, you've got a gaping hole in the cornea, in the limbus here, and the ocular contents will extrude with it. OK, so you want to take that foreign object onto the face, put the cartella shield on and just don't touch it until you don't, nobody removes it until they get to theatre. And then you've got the chemical injuries. You want to really carefully assess the ocular surface, look for areas of avascularity in particular, because those are really important because that suggests ischemia. And the risk of complications following chemical injury is far greater the more ischemia you've got. You will, you will have areas of hyperemia as well and possibly some, some conch hemorrhage, but those are less worrying. Uh, look at the cornea uh, for haziness, uh, epithelial defects and edema, and the more corneal haze and edema they are, the more worrying, um, because that would suggest that there's been more penetration of the chemical into the eye. Look also at the skin and just check the fornices as well, particularly if it was a plaster related injury, for example, to make sure you've removed any, any bits that might be leaching uh, alkali. And again, I say alkali is far more of a problem than acid because alkali penetrates much more easily easily acid tends to coagulate and stay on the surface. So the first thing if, for example, if anybody ever called you to report something, the first thing is to get them to rinse their eyes, okay? So just get stick their eye and face under tap water and rinse it for 10 minutes at least, all right? When they come into the A&E, we'll 
be irrigating them as well. And we usually do that by fixing the balanced salt solution to a giving set that sort of tube that you use for IV something. And you use that and you irrigate the eye. You have to finish the whole liter on the surface of the eye to make sure that you've removed as much chemical from the surface as possible. And then management, this wouldn't be your responsibility, but they'd be started on antibiotics and steroids to calm down inflammation. They'll be given dilating drops. We also give them vitamin C, both as oral to take one gram a day and drops to help reduce the polygenase activity that the chemical injury um, generates. Um, corneal abrasions are going to be common for you, uh, and they usually occur after superficial trauma, but they are associated with uh, chemical injuries, and sometimes that's the only thing you see if it's a very mild chemical injury, uh, some cleaning agent, for example, at home. They can be recurrent, so if they are recurrent, do consider they may have had an ask specifically for previous corneal trauma, so it might be recurrent uh, um, corneal endothelial syndrome, um, or sorry, recurrent corneal erosion syndrome, or they could have some underlying corneal dystrophy, okay? And you can see the subtle haze here in the cornea, which highlights really nicely when you put the fluorescein in. So this was a pepper spray injury. Um, you might be the one managing if they come into your uh, high street practice and so you're an IP optometrist, uh, topical antibiotics, we use ocular lubricants. I generally would suggest avoiding dilating drops. I'm not sure there's that much evidence. They make much difference for an abrasion uh, and there is a risk. And we've definitely seen quite a few uh, cases over the years at St. Thomas's where we have induced um, acute glaucoma on top of the abrasion while you're treating uh, because you gave dilating drops. Generally, and um, Lucia can comment more on that, our corneal team tend to prefer bandage contact lenses now, but instead of the um, sort of pressure eye patches that we used to do to, uh, because those, you just fit them, change them every week as you're observing, they tend to control the pain better uh, and you don't have the unsightliness of the pad or the worry about the eyelid opening up underneath the pad and exacerbating the uh, irritation on the surface. Corneal infections, um, by and large, most of the ones that we see are contact lens wear related. So soft contact lens wear related. So that's a really important risk factor. Other factors are things like corneal seat sutures. Um, so if you are seeing a patient in your practice who's had, uh, say, corneal graft or a uh, uh, cataract surgery and had to have um, sutures put in or glaucoma surgery. If you do see any loose sutures or um, sutures where the knots are sticking out, you know, please send them off to an eye casualty to have them removed. And it's really a telltale thing if you see mucus on it um, or it disturbs the fluorescein because that's a real source of um, and a risk for infection. And the infection can get down the um, suture track and introduce infection into the eye. But this is a typical sort of presentation of a pseudomonas con uh, ulcer in a contact lens wearer, the acantamoeba keratitis, which is seen in uh, soft contact lens wearers, again, particularly a problem. Um, so people shouldn't wear their contact lenses when they're swimming or in saunas. And it's particularly a problem when you've got a hot, um, hot water tank rather than um, water that's heated or matic, um, heated as it comes through uh, because the acanthamoeba like sort of warm water and they grow there. Um, this is a suture abscess here uh, um, in a corneal graft. And this is a more serious uh, corneal infection, which has um, got a full thickness ulcer and they've developed a hypopian as well. So those are so, but obviously these kind of patients would come straight to an eye casualty, but your, your, your role would be to, you know, I, to advise patients um, if you're seeing if you're managing contact lens wearers about the risks um, and also ask them to bring their contact lenses with them and the case because we will culture those uh, to help determine what the um, organism might be. Um, anterior uveitis, um, quite often we might present to you uh, this, this typical symptoms be photophobia, pain, watering, redness, and some degree, some element of decreased vision. On examination, you're expecting to find conjunctival hyperemia with marked limbal injection as a general rule. Look for the keratic precipitate, so little um, collections of inflammatory cells on the back surface of the cornea, uh, aqueous cells and flare. And you may also see iris nodules. If you do see those, do think of things um, like sarcoidosis uh, and look in the other eye as well, because um, iris nodules are more likely to be a bilateral problem. 
it's quite useful to know the underlying causes so that you can look for their, um, them and you can advise patients on their risk. So a lot of them are, at least a quarter of them, are just nonspecific um, uveitis. So there's nothing, um, no particular ocular pathology or systemic condition underlying it. But they quite often will be HLA B27, which is the haplotype, and that is a, predis is a risk factor for developing um, uh, anterior uveitis. Then you have the idiopathic specific uveitis, the Fuchs uveitis syndrome. And just to say, you know, net, if you're mon if you're monitoring those kind of patients or you know they've had the Fuchs uveitis, don't be tempted to try and eradicate every every inflammatory cell in them because they, they help. They often have a, a a little mild sort of anterior uveitis, and if in your desire to eradicate the inflammation completely, um, you quite often end up giving them a steroid induced glaucoma. Okay, so most of the time, if there's just the occasional cell in those sorts of patients, and there's no limbal injection, you really don't need to treat them for the most part. Systemic diseases can predispose to anterior uveitis, so things like sarcoidosis, psoriasis, ankylosing spondylitis are common as are infestations, so things like toxoplasmosis. So if you see a scar in the retina and the person comes back later with anterior uveitis, do have a look because you might have, there might be reactivation of the scar, which is typical of toxoplasmosis. And the inflammation in these patients would usually be more in the vitreous than in the, anter than in the anterior segment. Acute endothelmitis is a severe site-threatening condition, which is really important to be able to identify. And in this case, it's mu much more common after intraocular trauma or surgery or intravitreal injection. So just ask if they've had anything. So if they've had any injection uh, recently, that's probably the most common reason at the moment with the number of injections we're doing. Um, do make sure you send them straight up to the hospital that they were treated at, uh, if possible, to the nearest um, eye casualty. And if the inflammation in, in if you've got features suggestive of acute endothelitis but in both eyes, then you need to think about uh, an associated systemic infection, in which case the patient is usually very unwell okay, or about to be very unwell. So they usually have, they might have fungal infections, um, they might have some cardiac infections that have caused a septicemia, and those patients really need to be sent straight away to uh, an A&E um, that has an eye department preferably. Your feet, you know, because it's acute is a really severe inflammatory condition. Pain is usually very severe. They usually have quite marked conjunctival injection. They might have a hypopian. And because they often have a vitritis, they usually have a vitritis along with it, um, you'll, there'll be a decreased red, red reflex. You've got the hazy cornea, you've got uveitis, and you'll have the vitritis. And here, this person has um, inflammatory membrane because they've got such extensive inflammation, it's actually caused a sheet of infection in the pupil area. Acute glaucoma, I know we talked quite a bit about that, but here acute glaucoma is a sort of general um, sort of um, classification for these things. So you'll talk about someone who's had a rapid increase in intraocular, pre uh, intraocular pressure and it causes pain because it causes inflammation. So if you have someone who's had a slow increase in intraocular pressure, the pressure can be really quite high without them having any acute symptoms, okay? So to have pain, it has to generate inflammation and that to do that, it generally has, the pressure generally has to have gone up very rapidly. So the typical reasons for that would be primary angle closure, uh, uh, an eye that's predisposed to primary angle closure has now developed acute glaucoma or associated with uveitis, for example, where you're going to have inflammation or postoperative uh, where there's often inflammation, or they may have had a vitroretinal uh, procedure and they've had gas or oil put in, which has um, pushed the pressure up, and that is obviously an acute event. It can be precipitated by pupil dilatation in patients at risk of angle closure. So as your typical hypertropic small eye with a narrow van herrick. So do be aware, they you know, particularly if they've just recently been to di for diabetic screening, they would have been dilated, uh, that may be the cause, okay? And be aware that even if you're seeing them in your practice um, and, you're, and it can take a while for the pressure to be high. So if you think the um, anterior chamber is shallow, van, van, van herrick is quite narrow and you can to give them dilating drops for any reason, be aware that the pressure may not go up until four hours or more after the dilatation. Uh, 
Um, so the pressure initially might actually be quite normal. And when you're, if you're ever worried about the pupil dilatation um, in someone you think they might be at risk of angle closure, never be tempted to put, give pilocarpine after you've used tropicamide because that splints the pupil even worse uh, as the um, pupil is um, coming back down to normal size and you're more likely to get um, pupil block. Um, in our eye casualty, so if you're ever, you know, say working in eye casualty, in eye casualty or in an accident and emergency, um, acute glaucoma is commonly misdiagnosed by medics as a neurological emergency. So because they get nausea and vomiting, they think they've got raised intracranial pressure and they don't notice the fact that the eyes are red. Um, typical features would be reduced vision, obviously, uh, halos around lights. Uh, they will often have, usually have nausea and they may have vomiting. Uh, they usually will have a headache with quite severe pain around the eye and photophobia. Typically would have a red eye with corneal edema. Expect to see a shallow anterior chamber if it's primary angle closure, but as we know, that's not the only reason for acute glaucoma. And the pressure would usually be above 40 for them to be symptomatic. Um, optic neuritis is a, a condition where you have demyelination of the optic nerve in, um, is associated with multiple sclerosis and with neuromyelitis optica. NMO is more like common in blacks and MS more common in whites. So the typical features would be pain on eye movement, usually only one eye at a time. Uh, they'll have a relative afferent pupillary defect, which is really quite pronounced and presents early on because it's an optic uh, nerve problem. They'll have dyschromatopsia, so their color vision is going to be impaired. You might be able to assess that with Ishihara, or if you don't have that with a red pin, you'll see that the, on the side that has the optic neuritis, the red appears more less red or more brown. Uh, they can have visual field defects, uh, which can be variable, but they're usually centrocecal, so in the middle. And you may see optic nerve, uh, optic disc edema um, if the optic nerve head is involved. Okay. However, they have retrobulbar neuritis because the inflammation is in the bit of the optic nerve behind the, the back of the wall of the eye, uh, you're not going to see any optic disc swelling. Typical history then would be a patient who presents with worsening vision, which gets rapidly worse over a few days, usually two or three, um, two or three days. And then over time, it resolves, usually about two weeks, it's sort of come back to somewhere about where it was. But they, you usually find that even though they, they have improved dramatically over about that two week period, there is usually a residual defect in the color vision. The contrast is not quite so good. So the appreciation of grays and pastels may be a bit worse and brightness sensitivity may be impaired as well. So let's go on to the painless causes then, which are generally ischemic. Um, so we've got some anterior ischemic optic neuropathy, which is really quite common. It's probably the, one of the more, most common causes of permanent visual loss that, as a result of optic nerve disease in adults. And it typically occurs as we get older, so over the age of 40. There are two forms that you need to be aware of. There's the non-arteritic and the arteritic. So the non-arteritic is usually because we've had reduced perfusion um, in the blood vessels that supply the optic nerve head, okay? And that can be because you've had acute blood loss. So if you had sudden injury and lost a lot of blood, or you've had surgery and um, had to and, and, and lost a lot of blood during the operation, uh, that may be the reason, or, uh, more quite often more commonly they just have poor uh, arterial they have arterial hypotension overnight um, and the, the perfusion to the optic nerve particularly in, in older people tends to worsen uh, at night time and that can be the reason so they go to bed fine and they wake up in the morning with reduced vision typically it happens in people with cardiovascular problems so atherosclerosis diabetes hypertension and really helpful to look for that what we call a crowded disc which is a risk factor for developing this so this is a picture of the crowded disc so you're talking to use a smaller disc than average all the blood all the nerve fibers are uh, squashed into a smaller area so they'll have a small cup and those are people that if they also have cardiovascular risk factors you do really want them to make sure that they're looking after those their, their diabetes and their hypertension and their cholesterol problems really quite carefully uh, to reduce the risk of ischemic optic neuropathy. 
With the arteritic ones, here we have infarction actually happening as a result of inflammation in the short posterior ciliary arteries. And the underlying reason for this is something we call giant cell arteritis. So it's really very rare um, below the age of 50 unless the person has underlying systemic vascular inflammation. And the visual loss from arteritic ischemic arteriopathy is much, generally much worse than the non-arteritic forms. So you get features again, it's an optic nerve disease, so they'll have alteration of their color perception. They'll have an RAPD early on. Uh, you may see optic nerve swelling. Um, if you're seeing it in the acute stage, you may get retinal hemorrhage. It's probably a little bit more common in the non-arteritic form, and you tend to get cotton wool spots um, happening really mostly in the um, arteritic form, so the inflammatory form. Uh, field loss is sort of what it think, kind of field loss you may expect, uh, obeying the horizontal midline. Uh, and the once you have the defect, it just stays there. It generally doesn't change much at all. It doesn't worsen, doesn't improve. Um, otherwise, this could be mistaken, this bottom one, for a glaucoma with an arcuate defect. But it's static and there's nothing really in the optic disc um, that really or raise pressure or anything to suggest glaucoma, look carefully for pallor of the optic nerve head because that they might have had an ischemic optiopathy years before and you're just left with the residual field loss. Amaurosis fugax is quite a common thing and it can be quite difficult to distinguish this from various other sudden blurring of vision that patients might present with. But it's, it's defined as a transient monocular blindness due to ischemia or vascular um, insufficiency. So it's actually just a sign of other disorders. It's not really a diagnosis on its own. The visual loss will usually last five minutes or less when it's due to cerebral vascular disease. If they have repeated episodes and they have a, and then the visual loss becomes persistent, that would usually indicate uh, retinal or optic nerve ischemia, in which case, obviously, there, there's a significant risk of them losing vision completely. Um, they will often present with diminished or absent vision, so it's really quite short-lived, just lasts a few seconds to a few minutes. They may often also quite often quite describe a sort of shade, a shadow or something, a gray or black shade coming down over the vision, um, and they may have recurrent episodes. And there may be something particular that they're doing at the time. Uh, so I had one patient where he would get up uh, and, and he would suddenly notice that this funny thing. So something associated, some sort of movement that might suggest poor perfusion um, to your eye um, is significant. Usual causes of vascular spasm, embolus and inflammation. Um, you can, if they were seen in eye casualty, we'd give them a stat dose of aspirin, 300 milligrams. Um, obviously, when you're outside, you can consider doing that, particularly if you're an IP, but you do need to make sure you make sure they're not allergic to aspirin. They're not on any oral anti any anticoagulants because that could be a increase the risk of bleeding and they don't have any um, dyspepsia, any stomach problems, the gastroesophageal reflux disease, which might mean that you'll uh, exacerbate their peptic ulcer. Um, the whole aim of MAC, say this is just a more like a sign, really, uh, a clinical feature of an underlying problem. So you really need to be looking for cardiovascular risk factors and managing that. So they do need to refer to their GP, um, or to their GP for ongoing care, but you need to send them in the, in the initial period straight to accident and emergency or eye casualty, because there is an increased risk of retinal artery occlusion and stroke. Uh, when they come and see us in eye casual, they'll also need neurology and cardiology inputs. You do need to advise them not to drive until they're advised because there is that risk of a CVA. You don't want them having a stroke when they're driving, you know, leaving your practice. And they need to come back straight away to accident and emergency if they get any further events. Because I say, while they may present to an eye, per, an eye practitioner, it's actually not an eye disease itself. Central retinal artery occlusion, um, really quite rare to see these suddenly we usually acutely we usually see them um, way down the line because most people can't get to you soon enough but you'll hear you'll have sudden painless unilateral and usually severe visual loss the commonest reasons are embolism or thrombosis so again you've got cardiovascular risk factors diabetes and you know states where you've got uh, abnormally um, abnormal coagulation are usually the underlying risk factors. 
if they're in your practice, they present to you, what you can try and do is to reduce the intraocular pressure as much as possible. Um, and again, if you're an IP, you can give them 500 milligrams of cetazolamide to help lower the pressure. Uh, and you can try ocular massage pressing because the whole idea is that you want to try because they've got poor perfusion in the arterial system into the eye. So you want to try and reduce the pressure in the eye itself to, to encourage flow along the arterioles. You want the embolus um, to move as far to the periphery as possible to reduce the area of, um, of ischemia. Um, Again, these patients, we'd usually prescribe aspirin 300 milligram stat and to continue indefinitely. And you'll need to look into their cardiovascular status because you want to protect the other eye. Again, they need to be referred straight to eye casualty, but you might have time to do some of that massage um, before you do that. So here you've got the cherry red spot. So you've got, basically you see that because the whole retina is ischemic and therefore edematous and white. And you've just got the um, macula attached there here. And then this space, you've got a little area where there's a uh, uh, celioretinal artery here which is perfusing this area so it's not a complete it's not a total um, retinal ischemia and here you have little emboli so you can imagine if you've got these emboli if you are if you're able to massage and lower the pressure and get the embolus in this case, there's so many you would be able to, if you had just one or two, you might be able to move them along till they get to the bifurcation because the, the area of damage would be much less if you've got it to go to a branch somewhere here than somewhere down here. Um, and these are some of the conditions to think about. So oral contraceptives when they're pregnant, if they're known to have coagulation disorders, if they're known to have collagen vascular disease, um, migraine and hypotension can sometimes be a risk, but less so. And there are a lot of other things that cardiac, many cardiac conditions that could cause them to shed emboli into the system, which get to the um, eye. Retinal vein occlusion is one of the more common things that we see. You see what the central retinal vein occlusions, the hemiretinal vein occlusions, and you've got the branch retinal vein occlusions. But obviously, this is the most um, significant because you've got complete stasis of the blood flow out of the eye. Okay, You'll usually have much more widespread um, hemorrhages, um, deep and superficial. You'll notice that the blood vessels are dilated. Um, their veins are dilated and tortuous. You'll see cotton wool spots suggesting ischemia, and that would generally be a worse prognosis for vision, and you'll get disc and retinal edema. Knowing the extent of, that, documenting the extent of the hemorrhage is really helpful because it helps determine, you know, that, what that person's risk of ischemia is and uh, explain some of the visual field loss that you might see later on. And um, vein occlusions in the macular area are often associated with macular edema. So these are the main risk factors again, um, clotting, atherosclerosis, hyperviscosity, and slow, slow or turbulent flow in the retinal vessels are the, the underlying causes. Um, but, but having raised intraocular pressure or raised ret, uh, retroorbital pressure can compress the blood flow into the eye and exacerbate the problem. So again, if you are if someone has ocular hypertension, you weren't going to treat, but they get a vein occlusion, you really do want to treat it then. Uh, lots of systemic risk factors again, but so when you're taking your history, documenting this is really helpful um, because it gives us an idea of the risks, the, the underlying risks for the patient. So general management is either to evaluate and treat the risk factors, um, which are systemic. So the risk of progression, protecting the fellow eye, reducing their cerebrovascular mortality uh, and the risk of other vascular problems. And then you want to treat the complications. So the complications are generally macular edema, um, new vessels from the disc or elsewhere, but disc typically, and then neovascularization of the anterior um, segment, which can lead to neovascular glaucoma. Retinal detachment here now, uh, something that we are commonly exclude, trying to aim to exclude when people come in flashing lights and floaters. Uh, risk factors are myopia, ocular trauma, um, intraocular surgery, and retinal, if they've had retinal attachment in the other eye, that's a risk as well. So what happens then is that you have the retinal tear, fluid goes through from the vitreous underneath it, uh, and separates the retina 
from its uh, underlying blood flow. So again, here you can see a picture there with a detached sort of corrugated looking retina and the demarcation between detached and flat retina. Typical features we your photopsy and floaters, they may have a shadow of visual field defect, um, particularly as it's more extensive. They'll, they usually only get reduced central vision if the macula is affected, although that might be variable because the fruit may be coming and going, um, particularly if the retinal detachment is from below. And you look for your tobacco dust, which is the um, pigments that has come through the tear and is seen in the vitreous. So our management principle, when they come to us, we need to seal the break so that no more fluid can get through, and we need to oppose the retina to the choroid um, to, to seal. So we either push the retina inwards, out, or put, go into the eye and push the retina um, outwards towards the choroid, or less commonly now, we push the choro choroid um, towards the retina by putting uh, something on the outside to push the retina inwards. Vitreous hemorrhage, we see, um, uh, and is, you know, quite often usually you can't see what's happening in the retina because there's so much blood and vitreous cavity. And it can be sometimes difficult to diagnose because you just have this sort of emptiness or blackness um, to, the, to the space behind the lens. So why would you have that? Either because you've got abnormal blood vessels which are prone to bleeding. So that would be typically your neovascularization in diabetic retinopathy or following vein occlusion. You may have normal vessels that rupture under stress. Um, so if you have a retinal tear, for example, you can get a vitreous hemorrhage or it can be from an adjacent source. So if you had uh, um, choroidal neovascularization, blood can leak out from that area and into the vitreous and you get a vitreous hemorrhage that way. So things to ask about if the patient presents to you, have they had any injuries? Are they known to have diabetic retinopathy, particularly proliferative and needed PRP? Uh, anything to suggest a vein occlusion? Have they had a retinal break or detachment? And um, if you can't, if, if whenever you have a vitreous hemorrhage, one of the most important things you really do need to exclude is a retinal detachment because that requires urgent intervention. Very rare, but something to know about is the cis uh, Tursen syndrome where people present uh, acutely to neurology with a subarachnoid hemorrhage and they have blood um, in the retina and in, in the eye um, along with that and it's quite often misdiagnosed and you don't really with all the other more severe things going on in the brain you don't know the person can't see so they usually have sudden onset of floaters red or black clouds in the vision an absent red reflex they may there you can see blood in the vitreous at the slit lamp you'll need to do an ultrasound scan to exclude retinal detachment and you want to examine the other eye for clues. So let's go through the, the clinical cases then. So this is a globe rupture post um, blunt trauma. So as a construction worker, 36 year old, he was wearing protective glasses, but he was hit in the right eye by a piece of steel. And he presented with right eye pain and loss of vision. I'm sure you can already see that the anterior segment and the iris are looking unusual. OK, so he's got conjunctival hemorrhage. We already said that might um, hide a globe rupture. Um, he's got iris trauma. You can see the iris hanging down in here and the distorted pupil. His vision was only light perception. Uh, there was a relative afferent pupillary defect. There was no fluid visible leaking out of the eye and no fluorescein staining. But, um, so what we've done then is put the shield on because you're worried about globe rupture. Uh, and then he, when it comes to the um, eye casualty or the main A&E, he'll need a CT scan of his orbit and uh, an urgent referral to ophthalmology um, if he comes by A&E. So here is this patient's had a CT scan. Look at the um, left eye, which is normal. You can see the size of the globe here. And on this side, you can see how much smaller it is. And that's because there's been a rupture, which is hiding under all this hemorrhage and the intraocular contents have leaked out at this point. And that happened just behind the uh, lateral rectus. So the rectus will be squashed and it's just torn um, the, the globe. And so that's how, you, so then you have fluid collecting in the back part of the eye. So that's something to really always worry about when someone's had a blow, particularly if the pupil is dilated or there's a lot of hemorrhage, you do need to exclude that. So here now let's test yourself a little bit as I'm going along with this one. So it's an 80 year old man with two, year, two hour history of sudden painless loss of vision in his right eye. He's type two diabetic, he's got hypertension, he's got dyslipidemia, so he's on anti-cholesterol medication. 
vision, that presentation was hand movements on the right, but it was quite normal on the left at six and a six. So on the fundus there, um, for them, you can see multiple, rec uh, multiple retinal emboli. He had arterial attenuation. Um, so the arterioles were quite narrow. He had a cotton wool spot here and possibly one there and the left fundus looked normal okay so i'm thinking about what you think might be the likely diagnosis but i'm don't worry i'm not asking and i'm not picking anyone because i can't see anyone um so he's had a central retinal artery occlusion okay so that would fit with a profound visual loss and that's history of being painless which suggests an ischemia and his age and his cardiovascular risk factors this is uh, an image here of a, of a central retinal artery occlusion with again um, a bit of preservation of the macula in this area because of a uh, um, perfusion from a ciliary retinal artery here. So what would we do? We you do need to your, your, your main thing is to worry about the underlying causes because for the most part you can't do very much uh, for the vision usually at this point. So we need to exclude inflammatory causes so we'll do ESR, ESR and CRP. We will if there's still vision to make to preserve, try and reduce the intraocular pressure. So that's the ocular massage. We may sometimes do AC paracentesis, making a little cut into the anterior chamber to let some of the fluid out, and you'll give them IOP lowering medication. And then you'll look for causes, underlying causes. So one of the commonest things is stenosis of the carotid artery. So the blood flow to the brain and the eye is compromised. Uh, and in this case, the person had up to 99% stenosis on that side. So basically all the flow to the brain was coming from the other side. Um, he'd had ECG and echocardiogram looking for um, card, cardi cardiac causes and there was nothing wrong there. He was started on half aspirin given intravenous heparin and he had a right carotid endarterectomy which is where you do surgery on the carotid artery to remove the thrombus and the clots there and um, and, and put a patch graft over it but unfortunately the vision didn't improve which is the typical history after this but doing your carotid endarterectomy improves blood flow to the brain okay and um, reduces the risk of stroke and other uh, cerebral um, cerebral ischemia so it's really important to do that even though um, you weren't able to improve the vision so this is the a uh, 52 year old female presented with a four day history of photopsy and floaters in her left eye and a curtain like defect as well, known myope and she dependent on glasses for most of activities. Vision is still good, both eyes, six, six. Uh, intraocular pressure is 17 on the right, 10 on the left. And she had confrontation fields when normal on the right and suggestive a nasal field defect on the left eye. So diagnosis then, and I'll just leave you to decide what you think it might be. So obviously it's retinal attachment there. And again, you see, you know, have the vision, just because the vision is good, doesn't mean they don't have retinal attachment. It's just not, the macula is still on in this case. And we can see there also that the um, pressure was lower in the eye with retinal attachment. And that, if you've got those kind of symptoms and there's quite a disparity in the pressures, be really quite concerned that there's a retinal attachment in the eye with a lower pressure. Uh, and here you can see the retinal defect. Um, and so obviously we're going to refer to ophthalmology urgently and she's going to need retinal attachment surgery. Here we've got since the last case, we've got a 83 uh, year old female with a three, year, three hour history of sudden loss of vision in the left eye, but she gives a history of fatigue and severe headaches for up to six months, jaw claudication for the last 10 days and tenderness over the left frontoparietal parts of the face. She's had previous cataract surgery, she's known high myope, and you can see the myopic changes on the fundal photograph there. Uh, she's known hypertension, has asthma and dyslipidemia. Um, vision on the right was six over six. On the side on the left where she'd lost the vision, vision was no light perception. She had a reft, uh, ref, relative afferent pupillary defect. And again, pup the pressure was lower in the affected eye. She had a left tender temporal artery, which runs along here. She had retinal atrophy in both eyes, so did her myopia and age, but the left optic disc was pale and there were narrowed um, uh, arterial vessels. Otherwise, general examination, the patient was unremarkable. So diagnosis is temporal arteritis and they did a biopsy. If you did the biopsy, what you'll see with all the inflammation in the artery there is that the wall becomes very thickened. So the actual area where there's blood flow is very much less. And so that, that's why it explains why you get ischemia along with that um, arterial inflammation. She did have um, high dose intravenous steroids. And over time, although her visual field really looks horrendous, 
her vision increased, improved from no light perception to six over 7.5, and uh, with the disc still looking a little bit ropey. So this is just a summary of everything. I've given it to um, Bafina. She can email out to you um, with the, some of the more common and more severe conditions. So thank you very much. And I'll stop sharing. Good. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that um, quite, quite um, intense sort of short talk on sudden vintage loss. There's a lot to learn, a lot to remember. Um, I'm going to hit the stop recording.